Well, it's been warming up for 300 years. Or indeed, if you go back, depending on where you start, it's been warming up for 25,000 years. Um, so the fact that it's warming up now is not exactly new. Uh, the question is, how much warming are we causing and will we cause if we double the CO2 in the atmosphere? That's the question. And I'm afraid thousands of scientists haven't worked on this question. Doesn't have. That's the only question that matters in this debate. There's all sorts of scientists who've done papers saying if the amount of warming is going to be what the IPCC says it is, 3.3 degrees, then this will mean X, Y, and Z. Even then, I think they exaggerate a lot of them. But the fact is, the people who've actually said how much warming are we going to get and have done that by measurement and by observation and by the application of established theory to the results, those you can count on two hands and two feet probably. There really aren't very many who've done it. Very, very few papers. I've actually had to write to a scientist on the other side just today saying, please can he send me some papers from the other side that are done not by modelling, which can't do this, but by observation and measurement and experiment and the application of traditional established theory to these. And that's how science should be done, but as I say, very, very, very few of us have actually done it in that way. And let me give you some indications of how it is we are beginning to think we're right that it's only going to be around one Celsius for a doubling, if that. You can go back to 1750, and yes, there's been quite a bit of warming since 1750, all of 0.9 Celsius. Now, only half of that can fairly be attributable to CO2, if that. Let's call it half, let's be generous. Well then, from that we can work out, relatively simply, that for a doubling of CO2 over the next century, we would expect another one Celsius of warming, just as we've had approximately one Celsius of warming so far. And likewise, we can go back to 1950 and look at the last 60 years of relatively reliable temperature measures, and we can work out that the average rate at which the planet has warmed during the period when we've been adding lots of CO2 to the atmosphere, because before 1950 we really weren't much. It's, it comes out at, again, an equivalent rate of about just over one Celsius per century. So even if you do these elementary checks to see how fast it's warming, just over one Celsius per century is about it. Indeed, the maximum rate of warming sustained for more than a decade over the whole of the last 161 years since we kept global records measured with thermometers has been an equivalent of just 1.6 Celsius per century. And that's happened between 1860 and 1880, 1910 and 1940, and again between 1976 and 2001. So there's absolutely nothing unusual about the recent warming, which stopped at the end of 2001. About uh, this time of year in 2001, the warming stopped. There hasn't been any since. We've had 10 years without any. But the maximum rate of warming we've seen is the equivalent of 1.6 Celsius per century. And yet the IPCC is project projecting that in the next uh, 90 years it's going to be at an equivalent of about 3.8 Celsius per century. On what possible physical basis could such a sudden leap in the rate of warming be predicated, given that each extra molecule of carbon dioxide that we add to the atmosphere has less of a warming effect than any of its predecessors? This is a, a diminishing returns warming that we're getting. And so to try and say that if we're going to get a vast acceleration in the rate of warming we've had over the last 60 years, over the next 90, is entirely implausible. There is no rational physical basis for any such exaggeration. But there's also a more fundamental objection to the notion that we're going to get as much as, say, somewhere between 2 and 4.5, central estimate 3.3 Celsius of warming, because it is in fact well settled that the amount of warming you get just from the CO2 that you add to the atmosphere, is only one Celsius per doubling. We keep on getting this figure of one Celsius, whichever way you do the numbers, and that one will be quite widely agreed among all parties. But then what the IPCC tries to say is, well, there are things called temperature feedbacks in the system, which are net positive, in other words, amplifying the original warming. 
and that these feedbacks create uh, something like three times as much warming as the original one Celsius. It's actually 1.1 Celsius for a doubling, so multiply that by three, you get 3.3, which is the central estimate of the amount of warming that you'd get. But, you see, that means that if they're, if they're implying that here is an object, mathematically speaking, a climate object, on which feedbacks are operating, then there are rules about feedbacks, which the IPCC has very carefully not studied, or probably just doesn't know about them, because these rules come from process engineering and not from climatology. And the rules are that in any object on which feedbacks operate, if the feedback loop gain is greater than 0.1, then the object will become unstable and will eventually gallop towards a feedback loop gain of unity, which is the singularity in the feedback amplification equation, and at that point the whole thing blows apart. And you can simulate this, and you may think that's all gobbledygook, but let me explain how it works. You take, say, a microphone, and you hold it too closely to the speaker, through which the output of the microphone is being broadcast, and you'll get a shrieking noise. And as you hold the microphone closer and closer to the speaker, the shrieking will get louder until it's unbearably loud, and the circuit will blow. And when the circuit blows, the feedback loop gain in that circuit has risen to unity, just one. Now, 0.1 is the maximum loop gain that you would build into, let us say, an electrical circuit to prevent any such feedback from happening. So that's the maximum loop gain you could have. And if you have a, a loop gain of 0.1 in the climate, which is the maximum theoretically sensible figure, how much warming are you going to get? Just over one Celsius degree for a doubling. And the loop gain that is implicit in the IPCC central estimates that you're going to see 2 to 4.5 Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2 concentration with a central estimate of 3.3 Celsius per doubling. The loop gains implicit in that are central estimate 0.64 with a lower estimate of 0.42 and a higher estimate of 0.74. Those figures are entirely impossible. Not just implausible, they're impossible. Why? Because we know that the climate is in fact a highly stable object as far as temperature is concerned. Now, this may seem surprising, given that we know we have ice ages coming and going. But the fact is that global temperatures, in absolute terms, have not varied by more than 3% either side of the billion-year mean in the last billion years. And that's a tiny amount. That means that in temperature terms, the climate is remarkably stable. That, of course, is still enough room to give you all the changes you need between ice ages and, and hothouse planet. But the fact is that in absolute terms, that's a stable system mathematically. And there is absolutely no way that the system would have remained that stable over that period with all the shocks and changes that have happened to it, from the Milankovitch cycles, the orbital cycles, to asteroids, to heaven knows what else goes on in the climate, volcanoes, supervolcanoes, all these real sudden disruptions. If you had a feedback loop gain in that climate, that was anywhere near even 0.4, let alone 0.75, which is the top end of their estimate. You'd end up like Venus. You'd get a runaway greenhouse effect. But we haven't had one, notwithstanding that we've had, if you go back, you're too young to remember this, but in the Neo-Proterozoic era, 750 million years ago, at that time there was 30% CO2 in the atmosphere, at least. You may wonder how I know this. Well, if you go to Arkarula Station in the northern Flinders ranges of South Australia, you can see there tillite deposits. Now, tillite deposits, always in a little stratum of rather untidy jumbles of rock, that indicates where a glacier has been through. And they're right next door to deposits of dolomitic rock. How can you tell it's dolomitic? Well, they have curly mallee trees growing on them. A curly mallee tree will only grow on dolomitic rock, so you know it's dolomitic rock. And you can pour hydrochloric acid on it, and it will release the CO2 locked in the rock. Where did the CO2 locked in the rock came from? It came from the atmosphere. And you can only get dolomitic rock forming if there is at least 30% CO2 in the atmosphere above the ocean in which the dolomitic rock is going to form. We can do laboratory experiments to demonstrate this. And see, here again, you need to know a little bit of geology in order to do the, the climate science. 
We've already done a bit of process engineering to work out the feedback loop gains are impossible. We've now done a bit of geology to work out that the climate has been incredibly stable even after having had huge amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere in the past. And these glaciers, incidentally, were at sea level and at the equator at a time when there was 30% CO2 in the atmosphere. All right, allowing for the fact that there would have been more reflection of the sun back into the space because there was more ice around, allowing for the fact that the sun was 5% weaker then than it is now. It's got stronger since. Even so, you would have expected it would be quite impossible for there to be glaciers at sea level at the equator with 30% CO2 in the atmosphere. Would you like to know how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere today? Is it 20%? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 1%? No, it's 0.04%. And we have added only 0.01% of that 0.04. There was 0.03% there before, then it went up to 0.04, and it might go up by another 0.04 by the end of this century if we double its concentration. But this is entirely trivial compared with the previous concentrations of CO2, which nevertheless operated in a stable climate from the temperature point of view. And because it was a stable climate, notwithstanding these huge geological changes, which we can tell by the very existence of dolomitic rocks all over the world, we know, therefore, that the feedback loop gains that are implicit in the IPCC's central estimates of the amount of warming we'd get from CO2 are way too high to be at all physically possible and that therefore the IPCC's projections are simply way out of the right ballpark. They're far, far too excessive. They are totally impossible.